I am almost 80. So let's not hear more about that. I'm going to read uh, two poems having to do with the festival that uh, those first two times I was here. Um, first being a prose poem, uh, it, it, when Galway and I appeared together, uh, and then uh, a poem from the um, <clears throat> anniversary special. <clears throat> Allergies are not good at this time, even as cold as it's been, they exist. This uh, <clears throat> originally enough is called the James Wright Annual Festival. <clears throat> that night, we flew into Pittsburgh, where Tom Flynn met the plane to drive us back to Ohio, just over the river, into Belmont County, where we were to meet Galway and the hosts of the second annual James Wright Festival for supper and the chatter of a late night before the first day of readings. What I remember from the long ride in from the airport, a new spring night with constellations broken and the blurred edges of the foothills building against the wind in a wall up from the river is the dark and how it came into the car at a speed we understood, how it filled in the small lights going out everywhere behind us, how it moved on our faces, how later after dinner, all of us tiring, it touched all our faces. What I remember from Galway's face that night is how the next day he talked about the work up until the end on the last book, or didn't talk but got lost in the moment of the last poem of that Vence morning many times since, and how he waited there and thought with the many sources. On the Sunday, I spent the empty early morning wandering too, lost in Martin's Ferry, where down the street from the library, the Hessler brothers were still in business, and farther still the WPA swimming pool project plaque shown like a war memorial object. And I walked down to the water, the beautiful Ohio depression wide all the way to Wheeling, and saw that whatever the working terrors are, they are worse over there. On the other side, laid off Sabbath or dead time on the line, <clears throat> where hell is still a foundry and a glassworks, and an ice house filled with coal, where they take you out of pity in the morning before daylight and bring you back in the evening, fire in the sun, white of the eye of the moon, and that even the petty farmers, our fathers, had come down from the farms to cross. James Wright, Galway would finally say, had gone to the end of the table, which we will earn as we earn the daily bread set before us. And in Galway's face, in the room of the gathered that day, you could see the winter daybreak poem take form in a whole of the country, in high gold Mediterranean air, but lifted here like stone or lumber flat above the river. Things get to you sometimes. The other poem is um, kind of tricky. It, it has a lot of background, and I'm not going to waste our time filling that uh, expository information in, except to say there was a, a helper young man who uh, uh, sort of was guiding people around uh, 
of this little town and uh, helping with whatever they needed uh, in the way of amenities. Um, <clears throat> it was a Saturday evening, beautiful sun, sunset. Uh, Peter Stitt was here, and he and I took a walk, and we ended up at the statue of Elizabeth Zane and at the cemetery, which uh, seemed to be a Civil War cemetery. There were like two wars being memorialized there. Her, she was uh, Revolutionary period, and then the White Crosses of the Civil War, which puzzled us a little bit. Then this young man comes along and explains it all to us. Uh, he was very excited and exaggerated a few things. <laughs> the other thing was he had this tremendous scar from here to here. So you listened uh, more attentively. Ironically, this poem is about Stanley Kunitz uh, as the uh, senior member of that uh, uh, anniversary group. It's called uh, Reading with the Poets. There are other poets. Uh, will come up in the text which you'll, whom you will recognize. Whitman, for example. Uh, Whitman, among the wounded at the bedside, kissing the blood off boys' faces, sometimes stilled faces, writing their letters, writing the letters home, saying sometimes the white prayers, helping sometimes with the bodies, or holding the bodies down. The boy with the scar that cuts through his speech, who's followed us here to the Elizabeth Zane Memorial and Cemetery, wants to speak nevertheless on the Civil War's stone-scarred rows of dead and the battle here just outside of Wheeling, equal in death to Gettysburg because no doctor between the war and Pittsburgh was possible. Boys dressed like men, and men with gangrene first before the shock of the saw and scalpel. Three days between this part of the Ohio River and Pittsburgh. He knows. He is here since then, a child of history. And knows Elizabeth Zane saved all she could. Keats, all his wounded life, wanted to be a healer, which he was once at his mother's bedside, fails. Once at his brother's, fails. Whitman in Washington, failed. How many nights on the watch and it broke him. All those broken boys, all those bodies blessed into the abyss. Now the poem for Lincoln, now the boy with the scar almost singing. Now the oldest surviving poet of the war reading one good line, then another, then the song of the hermit thrush from the ground cover. Lincoln's long, black, brooding body sailed in a train, a train at the speed of the wind blossoming, filling and unfilling the trees, a man's slow running. Whitman had nowhere to go. So I leave thee lilac with heart-shaped leaves, he says at last, and went to the other side with the corpses, myriads of them, soldiers, white skeletons, far enough into the heart of the flower that none of them suffered, none of them grieved, though the living had built whole cities around them. Keats at his medical lectures drew flowers, not from indifference, not from his elegance. His interest couldn't bear the remarkable screams of the demonstrations. He sat there, still a boy, already broken, looking into the living body, listening to the arias of the spirit climbing. So the boy at the graves of the Union singing, saying his vision, seeing the bodies broken into the ground. Now the poem for Lincoln, now the oldest surviving poet, still alive, weaving with the audience that gossamer, that thread of the thing we find in the voice again. Now in the night, our faces kissed by the healer. Cunis, by the way, is the oldest surviving poet still alive at that moment.
from uh, uh, my time that I knew him when I lived in New York. Uh, as you may know, he um, was uh, he was a um, great grower of roses, and he had a place out uh, in near Provincetown that uh, was uh, his favorite place to retreat to. Uh, little known though, however, was that his uh, place in the village on 12th Street had a garden in the back where he also cultivated roses. And uh, I uh, was privileged enough to spend some time uh, drinking a little white wine with him out there uh, on Sundays. Um, we were doing a thing one time, walking from his place to NYU to inaugurate what became the Poetics Institute at NYU. Uh, and we were, I don't know why he got into this uh, deep melancholy uh, about his career. Now at this time, this is before we were in Ohio, so he was still in his young 70s. You know, he lived to be 105. Um, and he said the most remarkable thing to me, and it's terrified me ever since. He said, you know, Stanley, there, were, there was a decade when I never knew another poet, never talked to another poet. <sighs> That's loneliness. Anyway, this is Kunitz tending roses. Naturally, he doesn't hear too well. So that when he's kneeling, He's really listening at the very mouth of the flower. And the feeling in his hands, his sense of touch, seems gloved, if not quite gone. Though when he bleeds, he takes a certain notice, wipes it away, and then moves on. And winter eyes, the old have passions, winter eyes which see the pointless chill clarity, but must look close as his do, petal by petal, since the work is tactile, visual, cadenza, blaze, red fountain climbing, or like freestanding rhododendron, sunset gold medallion, scarlet maiden. His body bends depending on the height and cluster, or on a perfect scale, the stature of the rose, which, like the day, declines continually, meaning that toward evening he almost disappears among the fragrance, gala, and double flesh of roses, or when he's upright, back to the sun, is thin enough to see through, thorn and bone. Still, there he is on any given day, talking to ramblers, floribundas, Victorian perpetuals, as if for beauty and to make us glad, or otherwise for envy and to make us wish for more, if only to mystify and move us, the damasked, dusky, hundred-petaled interrogate the rose, ask the old who have the seminal patience of flowers, which question nothing less for why we ask, enchanter, ember, blood talisman, something to summarize the color of desire, arid or red passion, something on fire to hold in the hand, the hand torn, Caring. 
Jonathan asked me to read a poem that <coughs> is tangentially right uh, contextualized. <laughs> it takes place in Italy. If you think of Sicily as Italy, do we think of Sicily as Italy? Of course we do. The Sicilian uh, people think they're the first Italians, and maybe the only Italians, uh, if you spend any time there. Um, they are quite wonderful. There's a village on the western coast where the tourists don't go, uh, just uh, somewhat south of uh, Palermo, called uh, Erice, uh, E-R-I-C-E. It's about tw it's a medieval village. It's 2,500 feet up. So that uh, uh, when I was there, uh, you open the balcony and it's not fog. It's a cloud that comes in in the morning to greet you. It's just fantastic. And right down there uh, is the Mediterranean. Um, from that balcony, I uh, uh, in the afternoon when I was about to take my nap, there would be uh, the uh, this pack of dogs taking a nap. Uh, Italy is full of wild dogs. Uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> this group is very, very calm and very uh, polite, if you will, uh, around town. You'd see them all the time. But uh, they were always taking naps under my, I was on the third story, uh, always taking naps um, under my balcony. So I felt I had to, I guess, respond. You can't get dogs and Italy into the same poem without dealing with certain <laughs> archetypes of which I think you already are aware of. Uh, they're in here too. I'm sorry to indulge the cliche, but uh, couldn't help myself. Anyway, um, uh, Erice is completely marble. Everything is marble. All the buildings, all the cobblestones. Uh, the quarries are very, very close. Um, the other thing is, in the winter, in the tourist leave, there are only 200 residents. There are 30 churches there. <laughs> uh, in Italian, which is a joke for me to pronounce, but the uh, Matania de Signore uh, is what the uh, place is sometimes referred to. The sleeping dogs, you got that already, okay. The sleeping dogs of Erice. At half a mile, the 30 marble churches and cobbled marble streets feel light as air above the sky blue depths of the Terranean, feel able, in fact, to float as on the platform of a mountain, of a cloud, the Vatania del Signore, though the plural would make more common sense since the gods of the many mountains around the Mediterranean have each had their day conquering the history of the island, arriving in a morning fog from sea on a schedule fit for war. <coughs> Italy's been, or uh, Sicily's been conquered again and again and again. Right now, first light, the night ghosts of the air have risen off the sea or fallen from the sky or both at once. It doesn't matter. From this balcony, it's as if we have ascended into life in a wholly different way, purer in the purity of a velo venere. It will take all morning for the mist to disappear, especially from the slick stones of medieval village paths that still pass for streets and the shining stained glass windows so bright they'll stop the sunlight until the afternoon which is when I see them first, curled up for naps in an awkward, weedy courtyard, four stories down, spaced as if assigned, six of them at least, though their numbers tend to change depending on the day and where they trail, usually at the edges of the town, which is when I see them running, sometimes chasing, sometimes playing, but always together, but not always because the large dog lying or sleeping in the traffic of the Piazza Umberto is, I'm sure at heart, one of them. <laughs> Lean the way these hunters are living off the land, the kind when I was a kid in the country of Ohio we called strays, 
dogs who had been let out from the backs of trucks or cars to die or survive, burned the sores and starving. These, though, are Italians, Sicilians, who understand the value of community and numbers, the civilizing forces of the pack, so that when I see them now at different times at different intermissions, nuzzling or mating, I'd swear they are eternal of the mythic body back to the nursing loving founding of old Rome, mist turned into stone and stone turned inevitably to ruin, back into mist, as they too are quarried, cut to shape, interchangeable through time, and for a while, the drained blood, lilac color of white marble. This is another request, but uh, maybe more relevant for, for, for James. Um, if I'm thinking right, remembering <coughs> right, his favorite two poets were uh, Edward Thomas and uh, all our favorite poet, uh, John Keats. Uh, it's hard for Keats not to be your favorite poet, though that wasn't true for a long time, almost a century. Um, I suppose there's some, is there a doubter out there still? Uh, he, he needs to be arrested or she needs to be arrested. Uh, for his, own, his or her own sake, you know. <laughs> mm. Have you ever been to Hampstead? Which is, which is now considered part of central London, it used to be. Uh, and it's still, it was uh, in Keats's time referred to as the lungs of London and people who live down in the central part of the city had houses up, up there, uh, summer houses. Um, one of whom was Constable, the, the great uh, English landscapist, uh, John Constable, whose wife is not doing well, so in the summer they go out there to see if she can, she has TB. Uh, not unlike uh, the poet we just referred to, um, to see if she can improve. Um, and what the constable is doing in those summers is, for various reasons, uh, because maybe the landscape around uh, the village is not that interesting. He looks at the sky. He says the emotion in a painting is in the sky. So what does he paint? Clouds. In fact, he paints nothing but clouds for two whole summers. Uh, nothing else is in the picture but clouds. He's very meteorological about it. He puts the time of the day and the, weight, uh, the speed of the wind and all kinds of other notoriety relating to the weather uh, on the back um, of these paintings, which are done in oils. But he paints them on paper. It's got to be a metaphor for something. It's, since clouds are so ephemeral, it's as if he's imitating their nature. Uh, 50 of them survived. He did over 100 of them. Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, especially at the Tate, uh, spending time at the Tate, you'll see a, a handful of these uh, clouds. They're quite wonderful. Uh, and they're quite various, obviously, because the sky, it's an island, it's always changing. So I had this fantasy. Keats is in Hampstead working on the, the odes, spring odes, and his constable painting clouds. They never meet. How is that possible? It's not as if Hampstead is a large place. At least there's no record of them ever having met. Constable's clouds are for his wife, who's dying, but I stretch the point. This is a poem called Constable's Clouds for Keats. They come in off the sea, peaceable masters, and hold the sea in the sky as long as they can. And you write them down in oils, 
because of their brilliance and to remember in its turn each one. It's 1822 after the Regency and it would be right in the year after his death to think of these domed above the heath in their isolated chronicle as elegies of the spirit. Right to see these forms as melancholy hosts, even at this distance. Yet dead Keats is amorphous, a shapelessness, reforming in the ground, and no one you know enough to remember. He lies in the artist's paradise in Rome, among the pagan souls of sheep at pasture. You'll lie in Hampstead, where he should have stayed, to meet you on your walks up Lower Terrace, or along the crowning High Street heading home. Your clouds grow whiter, darker, more abstract, from one elaborate study to the next. Correlatives are close to the real sentiment that lives, you say, in clouds subjects to counterweigh the airy gravity of trees and leaping horses. Keats could have met you. You must have seen him once against the light, at least. He could be crossing on Christchurch Hill Road now, then over to the Elm Road and down Old Admiral's Walk. He could be looking at the clouds blooming between buildings watching the phantoms levitating stone. He was there your first heath summer writing odes, feeling the weather change from warm to chill, focused no less than you on daylight's last detail, wondering what our feelings are without us. A cathedral is an imitation of two great elm trees meeting over mm -hmm. a street. I miss the elms, their crowns of airy dreams, as Virgil calls them. Their towering cathedral branchings spread into a ceiling above the lonely sidewalks of Ohio, where the first elm deaths were reported in America. I miss in particular the perspective looking down the distances of all those elm named streets disappearing into dusk, the last sun turned the stained blue of church windows. I miss standing there letting the welcome dark make me invisible. I miss the birds starting to sleep, their talking in their songs becoming silent then there's silence. I even miss not standing there. And I miss a life of nothing but such moments as if they'd never happened. And all you had to go on was their memory and the feeling in the memory, forgotten, but brought back again and again because you miss someone you love. 